for your grace and your love. If it had not been for you, who was on our side, tell us where will we be? For your word says, while we were yet sinners, you died for us. A good man you sent to die for bad people. Thank you, God. You didn't have to do it, but you did. Thank you, Lord. Even in our sinful ways, you still saw an opportunity in us to make us available to help somebody else. Give us that courage again, God, to be of a help to somebody. Looking past our own needs and seeing the needs of others. Your son Jesus said, if any man must come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Must Jesus bear the cross alone and all the world go free? There's a cross for everyone. There's a cross for me. Thank you, God, for my cross. Because in order to get my crown, I got to have a cross to bear. Thank you, God, for the burdens. But you said, come unto you all who are weak and heavy laden. Take my yoke upon you. For my yoke is easy and my burdens are light. Help us to give it to you, God. So that when you give us our charge to keep and the God to glorify gave your son our souls to save and fit it for the sky. This world is not our home. We have no friend like you. We're just pilgrims and sojourners traveling through this barren land because we know that one day we're going to see you face to face. It'll be all over on this end and we shall, we shall put down our cross and wear a crown. In your father's house, Jesus said, in your, in your house there are many mansions. If it were not so, you would not have told us. So you go away to prepare a place for us, that where you are, we're going to be there also. My father's got a mansion, and one of them belongs to me. So help us to send up some timber while we're on this side. Because of our thanksgiving for your salvation, and we would do good works to show our appreciation. But you bring us out of the darkness and walking into the marvelous light. Help us to stop by the nursing home, stop by the hospital, stop by the homeless shelter, stop by the prison. Go see about somebody else. God, you have been good. It could have been us locked up in jail. It could have been us laying on that hospital bed. It could have been us in the nursing home. But you allowed us to be here today. For that, we say thank you, God. Bless the choir that will sing songs of Zion. Bless every man and woman under the sound of my voice. That we'll remember in everything. We ought to give thanks. In Jesus' name we pray. For a sake we say amen. amen. Talk to my nation. Tell me everything's going to be all right. Sometimes we have to just deny self and say that we really are going on. All right. Satan has a way of fooling us to death. He would get us all messed up, confused, and we'll sit around and we'll start just dragging around, just sitting around, and God wants us to be busy. But we let this flesh tell us to sit down. All right, all right. We got to realize the enemy. We got to recognize him. This is a 
the spiritual war that we are yet in. We've got to be obedient unto God's word. He said to wait, be patient. But now in that waiting and being patient, we got to work. The young lady spoke this morning and she said that while she was yet going through these treatments, she sang on three different choirs. She was in church. But there's some time and so often that we get sick, we stay at home. All right, all right. Or sometimes we're not sick and we still stay at home. Satan just winning the war against us. Woo. We are not even giving God a chance to do nothing because we sit that on. Hello. We need to be in Sunday school on Sunday morning. We sit that home. We need to be in Bible study, but we're sitting at home. And we blame the God sometimes because we don't have what he said we should have. But the reason we don't have because we're sitting at home. But anyway, we're going home. We're on our way home.
think they might have heard me. How many know he'll fix it? He'll fix it right now. Amen. Someone's gonna want to let God fix it. Decided in his heart, not out of regret or out of necessity, for God loves a cheerful giver. And God is able to make every grace overflow to you, so that in every way, always having everything you need, as you may excel in every good work, as it has written, He has scattered, He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. Verse number seven again says, Each person should do as he decided in his heart, not out of regret or of necessity. For God loves a cheerful giver. If you really like your neighbor, won't you grab him by the hand and look at them and say to them, Say, God loves a cheerful giver. Now if you don't like him, still grab him by the hand and say, God loves a cheerful gift. Amen. Amen. God loves a cheerful gift. shall be like the stars. He told them he would bless him and make him a great nation. He would bless those that blesses him and curse those that curse him. God has a cattle on a thousand hills. 
He has all of the silver and gold. As the prophet Haggai said, the silver is mine and the gold is mine, says the Lord of hosts. He has an abundant supply of blessings. Unfortunately, many churchgoers give with an attitude of regret. Regret is defined as a feeling of sorrow or remorse about something that has happened in the past. The unfortunate thing is, is that while God has an abundant supply of blessings, why God has been better to us than we have been to ourselves. Why God continues to look beyond our faults and see every one of our needs. That means that we have to understand that, that he has a obligation that he has placed upon us. And that obligation is to be a demonstration of that abundance and of that goodness. We must be an extension of the blessings of God because God has been good to us. That means that if he is before us, uh, that means that we can always look to him uh, for where all of our help comes from. There's no need for anybody in the body of Christ to live in regret and feeling sorrow or remorse about something that's happened in the past because while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He took care of us when we could not take care of ourselves. He watched over us when we could not watch over ourselves. And, and because of that, our perspective on giving can change when we move from an attitude of regret to an attitude of generosity. Our attitude should be of one that is generous, meaning that God has more than enough to go around. That God looks beyond our faults and sees every one of our needs. And because he was generous and gracious unto us, because we now understand that, we can also be generous unto others. Our attitude about giving should reflect our knowledge of what God has versus what we may have. We, when we understand the word rich, then we cannot apply that word unto ourselves. Because what we might have in the bank today, 2008 taught us that we might not have it in the bank on tomorrow. But God would never run out of money. Because he has all of the silver and the gold. And the Bible says that the earth is the Lord and the fullness thereof, the world and they that dwell therein. In other words, whatever we have need of, our knowledge should basically be that God's got it. From a personal experience, I have enjoyed the blessings of the Lord so much that I cannot keep God's blessings to myself. God's been so good to me that I can't help but to tell somebody else about him. God has taken care of me, so I have an obligation to tell somebody else he'll come see about you. God has looked beyond my faults, and so because he's done that, I can't help but to tell somebody else that he's good. I'm glad I got Jesus, because if I didn't have him, I don't know where I would be. And that attitude of gladness and cheerfulness is the same thing that God is looking for from the church. God wants the church to give with a purpose and gladness in our hearts. God loves a cheerful giver. Our blessings are dependent upon not, not just how we give, but also the purpose of our giving. If we were to really be like our father Abraham, who had many sons. And as many sons had Father Abraham, every summer during vacation Bible school, we say, I'm one of them and so are you. So let's just praise the Lord. Abraham was blessed because he knew where his blessings came from. Abraham was a cheerful giver because he knew that wherever he had received, he knew where to go back to to get it. The attitude of every giver must be cheerful because God is cheerful when he gives to us. The purpose of our giving must be in order to please God. The Bible says that without faith, it is impossible to please God. God. He that comes to God must believe that he is a reward of them that diligently seek him. In other words, the attitude of our giving should be cheerful and the purpose of our giving should be obedience because obedience is better than sacrifice. And I'm looking at some blessed people today. How do I know that you're blessed? Because the Bible says that everything that have breath, praise the Lord. 
If you want spiritual enrichment from your giving, you must practice enjoyment and be glad for the opportunities to give. So that means that everybody that has breath today, when the opportunity to give is made available, that we should all get up. In the same way that we walk to the gas station to scratch off the lottery, in the same way that we walk in the grocery store to buy our Roman noodles, the same way we should get up to walk to the front of the church and give our offering to the Lord. If you want spiritual enrichment from your giving, you must practice enjoyment and be glad for the opportunities to give. Look at God's promises to faithful givers. If we give, God is able to give us more so that we can perform other good works. Songwriter said, if you can't beat God's giving, no matter how you try says the more you give, the more he gives to you. Just keep on giving because it's really true. In other words, God sees to it that the generous giver would not suffer in want. Giving is like sowing the seed. The size of the harvest is determined by the amount of seed that is sown. So if the farmer sows little, he's going to reap little. The farmer sows much, he's going to reap much. The believer is to give freely and cheerfully, not out of compulsion and not with regret. Because the Bible says that God loves a cheerful giver. All of us to check to make sure that we all target with the message. Look at your neighbor and see if your neighbor is smiling. The smile on their face is really not because of them looking at you. The smile on their face should be really based on their experience with God. A God who has been good. If your neighbor has a good memory and they're not suffering from amnesia, they can look back over their life. And think things over and see that time and time again, God watched over them while they were on the hospital bed. Time and time again, God watched over them while they were in their sick bed. God looked beyond their faults and saw every one of their needs. So the question is today, because we already know that God is good. Because we know that God loves a cheerful giver. How do we give cheerfully? The answer today is in our text. Paul wrote two letters to the church at Corinth. And this is the second letter. And he was writing to them in response to many questions that they had had about how to handle problems in their church. And the Corinthian church had even questioned the authenticity of Paul's apostleship. The Corinthian church had even questioned if some of the offerings that they had gave to him to deliver to poor Christians in Jerusalem had actually been delivered. And so Paul is writing back to them to respond to them and to let them know that he had did just what God had told him to do. And they should follow him as he follows Christ. If the money that they had taken up to help those that were poor and needed, to the widows and the orphans, had been done so to be a blessing unto someone else, they should not be doing it with a negative attitude. They should not be doing it with worrying about how God is going to take care of them. He's reminding them that God loves a cheerful giver. So the first thing that we understand in how we give cheerfully, the first thing we need to do is sow bountifully. Look today and say sow bountifully. Verse number six says, remember this, the person who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. And the person who sows bountifully shall reap also bountifully. My brothers and sisters, this is a reminder from Psalms 112 and verse number 9. It's a metaphor to let them know that in order to understand how the farm really works, the farmer can do one of two things. He can take advantage of the seeds that he has and he can try to enjoy all of them for himself. Or he can take a few of those seeds for himself and take the remaining of the seeds and scatter them all about the field that he has planted. Wow. 
loud. And the benefits of doing that is, is understanding that that small part that you have put aside for yourself now, you're going to enjoy a greater benefit by taking the larger portion and scattering that among the field because you're going to reap a large harvest. And what that word bountifully means in the Greek, it comes from the Greek word elongia, which means blessing. It means praise. It literally means gift. And what that word before it literally means is the word near. So when you sow bountifully, that means you're going to be near your blessing. You're going to be near your praise. You're going to be near your gifts. And a lot of folk, if you really want to check their stewardship, you start looking at how they give during the year and watch how they give around Christmas time. Around Christmas time, many Christians all over the country uh, begin to draw back from their giving in church uh, because they're putting aside uh, the gifts for Pookie and Shay Shay uh, and Big Mama at Christmas time. Uh, they even camp out in the parking lot uh, at Best Buy and Belk uh, and Macy's uh, because they want to spend money that they don't even have uh, on folk that they really don't even like. Uh, but your blessing uh, is being put on delay uh, when you give to everybody else uh, before you give to God. I want to keep my blessings close to me. So I got to learn how to be a cheerful giver. I got to sow bountifully. That means that the blessing is inside and sold up in how I sow. The blessing and the praise is tied up in how I sow. The gift that I receive from God is tied up in my sowing bountifully. Yeah. The word bountifully literally means blessing. Praise and gift. Secondly, after we understand that we need to sow bountifully, we need to see the blessing. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, see the blessing. <laughs> so the farmer, once he gets some experience uh, with sowing and reaping, uh, the next year when harvest time comes, uh, and even the next year when the planting time comes, uh, the farmer can already see uh, in his mind's eye what the crop is going to look like. Uh, based on what he sold. The farmer's not going to go out there at harvest time and look for crops to be sprouting up if he hadn't already planted something. That's why some of us don't even need to look for no blessings. Because if we ain't gave nothing, we should expect to receive nothing. And though we don't even be looking at nobody else and wondering how she got that husband, how did he get that wife, how did she get that car, how did he get that house, because if you sow uh, bountifully, you will be able to see the blessings uh, as a result of your soul. Look at verse number seven. It says, each person should do as he decided in his heart. The King James Version says, as he purposed in his heart. Not out of regret or necessity, because God loves a cheerful giver. The word purposive in the Greek comes from the word proeromai, which means to decide beforehand, to determine. It means to bring out. Let me tell you what your pastor does, and I hope you can follow my example. I know how much money that God has given me. So that means if I already know how much he's given me, I also can easily figure out what 10% is of what he's given me. So that means I already know beforehand, before I get to church, how much my tithes and offering needs to be. I ain't got to wait to figure out when I get here and fumble through my bulletin in my envelope and sit there and try to calculate what how good God has been to me. I already knew that before I got here. So I already decided beforehand, before the worship service even began, that I'm going to make out my tithes because he's been good. Some of y'all understand that already. you got to already make up in your mind that God is going to bless you because you've already sold back in verse number six. So you can see the blessing in verse number seven. I ain't got to worry about how you're going to take care of me or even my family because I can be like the songwriter said the Lord is blessing me right now so if you want your healing if you want your help if you want your hope you need to learn how to see the blessing Paul said each person should do as they have decided 
in their heart. My brothers and sisters, giving not only has to be in your head, but it also has to be in your heart. You got to make up your mind that you're going to do what God said. So Paul is trying to help the church to understand how to be a cheerful giver. He said that we need to sow bountifully. He says that we need to see the blessing. But thirdly and lastly, I love this Bible verse as it teaches us we also got to share the benefits. <laughs> Look at your neighbor and say, learn to share. <laughs> verse number eight says, and God is able <laughs> to make every grace overflow. <laughs> he says, overflow to you so that in every way, <laughs> always having everything you need, <laughs> So you shall may excel in every good work. I'm so glad that the King James says to make every work abound toward you. And that word abound in the Greek comes from the word periseso, which means increase. It means overflow. It means more than enough. And I ain't got to worry me when I've been reaping and sowing for a mighty long time. There is not enough corn. There's not enough of grapes. There's not enough apples or even pears for God to grow just for me. He grows them in abundance so that I can harvest them and share them with other folks who have needs. I'm so glad that God gives me the increase so that I can share the benefits of that increase. So that I can share the overflow of that increase. Some of you have come to me when there has been a year of overflow. When there's some pear trees in my backyard and I bring the pears to the church and I give a few out to the members and they say, Reverend, there were some good pears. They were the best pears that I ever tasted. And there's not just enough for the members. There's some folks down in Lawrence County and even in Greenwood County that even after I ate some for myself and gave a few to my members, even gave some to my neighbors and gave some to the folk back home, there was still some grapes. And there was still, excuse me, some pears, even for the groundhog, even for the yellow jacket, even for the birds and the bees. That means there was a lot of others to go around. That means it was enough for everybody to share. If you really want to be blessed, you gotta so bountifully. You gotta see the blessing, but you gotta share the benefits. And all I'm trying to tell you is, you can't be God's given, no matter how you try. Paul reminded the Corinthians about the principles of giving. Giving is like sowing a seed. What you get is linked to what you give. The farmer who sows only a little seed will only get a poor harvest, while the farmer who sows generously will reap a rich harvest. In Christian giving, both the thought and the attitude count. Paul asked Corinthians to consider carefully what they gave and then to give it cheerfully. God himself, can I get one witness, is a great giver. He provides in all kinds of ways, in crops and in foods and in spiritual gifts. His greatest gift is sending his only son to be the savior of the whole world. The Corinthian church discovered that the giving that they themselves will receive, they were enabled and encouraged to be generous on the many future occasions. There will be a great harvest of praise to God when people see that his grace is sufficient. I'm so glad that the songwriter had this. It said when praises go up, the blessings will come down. I ain't got to wait to hear 
what the doctor says. Because I'm already praising God. Oh, my way to the doctor. I ain't got to wait to see what the lawyer says. Because I'm already praising my way on the way to the courtroom. I ain't got to wait to hear what nobody got to say about their situation. Because I already know that God is good. I gotta close and tell somebody here. There's a story about a family that was sitting at the dinner table. And as they sat at the dinner table, they were talking about church that Sunday morning. Somebody at the table said, the preacher, he wasn't talking about that today. The son started off to say the sermon that Red Preach was boring. The sister turned in and said, yeah. the table. He looked at every one of them. 